Today, we're going to examine the Parsha of Korach and the, the concept of the power of speech, the power of speech. We're very familiar with the story of Korach, uh, and I will just briefly tell the story. But obviously, Korach, being a great wealthy man, uh, apparently a tzaddik at some level, you know, a leader of his people. And in this parsha, it talks about how he approached Moshe and Aaron and challenged their leadership. His challenging of their leadership also began to severely affect uh, a larger group, a community per se. As actually, there's um, sort of a differing opinions. The Maimonides talks about two concepts or ideas as to why did Hashem say to Moshe to distance himself from this community. And the question was, is he talking about the whole community of Israel or just this small band of rebels that wanted to cause difficulties? And it is clear that... Korach was able, with the power of his speech, to stir up disaster for Israel and for those people that had followed him. And there is some debate as to whether some of the men that de departed from that, went to their wives and departed from, from the whole scene, uh, whether their wives were able to convince them that there is... Uh, uh, commentary in Midrashim that talks about that very thing. But as I begin to examine what can we learn about this story uh, that can help us in our daily life in creating a vessel. We constantly talk about having a, a midot, a character that creates a vessel that brings about blessing in our life. And I was having a conversation with someone the other day, and we were talking about a person, uh, in, like hypothetically, about a person who, say, uh, is great in their, in their Hebrew, they know Torah law, uh, they're, 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 they know their Judaism, front to back, but there's some little chink in their armor that causes them to have horrible character, uh, what do you call it, uh, character traits, uh, angry, you, you just name it, whatever in their character trait. And so the debate between these, myself and this other person is, has that person really obtained any Torah? I mean, that's really the question, because if you've obtained Torah, or the chuchmah, the wisdom of Torah, or the da'at, the knowledge and wisdom of Torah, that knowledge, if you've obtained that, then it has to have an effect on you, right? I mean, how can you say you've obtained something and it not have an effect on you? That would be like me trying to convince you that I work out six days a week. I know it's funny, but <laughs> that'd be like me convince, thinking about it for a second. I mean, I could tell you that, but you'd go, mm, I don't think so. Why? Because I don't look like a guy who works out six days a week. So the point is, is when someone says, oh, you know, they can quote the Torah and they know Hebrew, and they, know, they even daven three times a day. But there is something within their character that has, that is, the vessel is too full of, of negative things. I'm concerned whether a person has, uh, has actually received Torah. And so I realized that Korach, they say was uh, a very influential leader and had great wisdom, knew the Torah front to back as, you know, as good as anybody else. And that's why he felt like that he should have been given a shot at being a priest, right? But there was something about the power of his speech that ended up bringing complete destruction for him. It completely destroyed him. Rabbi Nachman of Brislav has a section in his book, uh, in the book called Advice, that s talks about its power for good and evil speech. And I would like to go through and sort of expound on and provide some commentary of things that, as we've learned from the Ramchal, 
are very familiar and not out of the ordinary, but it needs to be refreshed. I really do believe it needs to be refreshed. Rabbi Nachman first says that idle pursuit and abusive slanderous language brings a person to poverty. What does he mean? Does it mean literally if you're abusive and, uh, and you're idle pursuits and slanderous in your Torah that the poverty means that you're going to be a poor person, right? No money. Does that, is that really what it means? No. We know a lot of people who are very rich that are very slanderous and abusive in their language. We're talking about a person, poverty, is lacking in wisdom. They lack it. The remedy, obviously, to that is over and over the sages of blessed memory remind us that giving charity helps to bring wealth to us. So if we want to remedy our poverty because of our idle speech and negative speech, then learn how to be a generous person. Generosity brings about blessing and wealth. It says the study, to study Torah by speaking the words aloud, uh, aloud, uh, aloud, sorry, is very important. And it says that words when they're spoken aloud, when the Torah is actually, when you read, for example, the Torah, and it, you speak it out loud, that it produces a light that illuminates places in your life that will cause you to want to do tshuva and repentance. If you speak Torah aloud, so for example, when you read the, the par par Parsha, or you read some uh, commentary on Torah, reading it aloud helps to create something in the spiritual world that illuminates. It's a light that comes on. And eventually, one can achieve perfection in this repentance, and then will come to understand the very depths of Torah. So it's, it's one thing produces another, which produces a greater result. So when one reads the Torah and speaks it aloud, or has discussion about Torah, often we will be talking and we'll have a discussion about Torah, that you're bringing light. The light helps to illuminate things in, my, in our life that needs to be corrected. When we make the correction, we create a vessel which allows us to receive understanding in Torah. And so a person who is lacking wisdom, obviously is not speaking words of Torah in such a way that they're creating light in their life. One must strive to sanctify our speech. What does it mean to sanctify our speech? Clean it up, maybe, right? To make it holy and worth something. Now, of all people, I'm one of these guys with my sense of humor that sometimes I've ha I have to check myself because I just say funny things because funny things are constantly in my head. And at the same time, I don't need, you know, that's how, that's how Shem created me and I'm thankful and I'm not trying to be some serious person, but at the same time, I want to make sure my speech is sanctified, that it's clean, that it's pure. And it says here that, that, that uh, speak many words of Torah, for a person to speak many words of Torah, say many prayers and to make many entreat, entreaties before God. It says, talk to him, plead with him, and at the same time be careful to avoid any falsehood and derogatory comments about other people. If you're careful about the way you speak, it will help you achieve personal sanctity and guard the Holy Covenant. And the more you purify and sanctify yourself, the more you will be able to perfect the way you speak. I had someone ask me, um, what was my opinion between a couple of rabbis? What was my opinion? What did I think? And I, and I told the person, well, first of all, my level of scholarship is nowhere near these rabbis. And for me to give you my opinion is useless. It's, it's not, my opinion doesn't mean anything. But I reminded this person that Rabbi Nachman tells us to not involve ourselves or entangle ourselves in the dispute of the Rabbanim. When rabbis are disputing between themselves, then don't get involved in the dispute to avoid that. And I have, you know, I don't know, I, will, I guess wonderfully appreciated that because it's kept me from getting in trouble, right? And I guess I'm not interested in conflict, so it's just better to not say anything. And the reason why I think it's important is later on we're going to see 
that that your words have power. And though someone might ask me my opinion of something, doesn't mean that my opinion needs to be expressed. I said this to someone the other day who constantly says what they think. And I said, and this person said, well, I'm just, I was just saying, I was just speaking up. I was just saying, you know, what I, did I say anything? That we, what I said, was it wrong? I said, no, not at all. So the problem is, is you don't have to always say something. It's not necessarily what is said, it's how it's said. It's how it's brought out. And this idea of sanctifying the way you speak is very important. Sometimes I wonder if, okay, you know how you can say one thing and in your mind you're insulting a person or hurting a person, but it, the words themselves are not hurting a person, right? Here we go. Okay, genius. All right? Oh, that was genius. Really smart of you. Right? That's complete negative speech, right? Now, Rabbi Nachman continues on. He says, words which are neither listened to nor accepted cannot be speech at all. Now, think about this. Words which are neither listened to nor accepted can be speech at all. The way to discover true meaning of the gift of speech is through speaking the words of the Zadikim. Speaking the words of the Zadikim. This is complete tikkun for speech. Now, the reason why that I'm going through Rebbe Nachman's quotes on this power of speech is the very idea that we are going through this, we're bringing power to our speech. When we take, and, and the reason I think it's so uh, powerful in Judaism that we always quote a source. We'll say, Rebbe Nachman says this, uh, you know, Rashi says this. We're elevating the power and authority of our speech just by quoting what these great rabbis say. Now, here is an interesting thought. We talk about vessels. We talk about carving out or, you know, forming a vessel so that uh, providence and blessing can come into our life from a ship. Rabbi Nachman says this, speech is the avenue, the vessel, the delivery mechanism which brings blessing. Think about this. So if you want blessing, it is speech that brings it into your vessel, right? So you can form a vessel and say, okay, I have this vessel formed. When are you going to fill it, Hashem? But if you don't have the conduit for the blessing to come into your life, then you're not going to receive blessing. So that means that my speech becomes the conduit for the blessings of God. So if I want blessings, then I constantly strive to do tshuva, every day of my life by sanctifying my speech, being careful what I say, elevating it up at all times. I went to uh, the uh, little grocery, not a grocery store, a little spot, stop and go or whatever you call it. Uh, this morning early I wanted to get me one of those five hour energies because I didn't have any hours of energy. <laughs> so I walked in and the poor woman behind the counter looked exhausted or upset. And so I bought this, and I said, are you okay? And she said, and I've never met her. She goes, yeah, I've just been up here since 8 o'clock uh, last night. So she, she, she'd, been, she'd been up there since 8 o'clock, and it was 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock this morning. And I said, oh, my goodness. I said, I, I don't think I could do that anymore. I used to do it for years. I know what it's like to work night shift. She goes, well, I've got a lot more years on you than, than you have on me. And I said, I don't think so. And she said, how old are you? So I told her, my, birth, my birthday. And she went, oh, well, actually, we're the same age. And I said, well, you need to take care of yourself and be well. Just be well. Things will get better. I could have went on and talked all about all kinds of bad things, why her life is terrible. But saying to another human being, be well, is a very powerful thing. Not only does it elevate her, but I left the place feeling the power of those words even in my own self, like telling someone to be well, be in kind. Often we, we're all guilty of this, 
of talking to our children and our spouses in ways that we wouldn't talk to other human beings. I tell parents this on a regular basis, especially with um, young people that are getting up in, into teenage, preteen and teenage years, that parents have to shift the way they communicate to their children. If you continue to talk to them like they're five years old, guess how they're going to behave? Like they're five. If a spouse communicates to her husband or a husband to a wife like they are a child, guess what your husband or wife is going to, how they're going to respond as a child, an angry, upset child. So your words are very powerful. I've had parents tell me, well, you don't understand. I know my son is 14 or 15, but he acts like he's 10. And I said, well, then you have a bigger responsibility to treat him and speak to him with respect. If you ever want him to act 15, then you have to start talking to him like he's 25. And if you do that, you'll accomplish it. It works. I know because I, I'm a practitioner of that. And I know what it's like to have an environment in which you get annoyed and irritated at your children and you just pop off and say something that you wouldn't dare say to a coworker. As a matter of fact, if you did, you'd probably get yourself punched in the kisser <laughs> in a heartbeat. And so we have to be careful. Speech is the breath of the li lips of the Holy One, blessed be He. To abuse it is to make it into a wild blast or a raging storm, according to Psalm 148.8. This raging storm wind is a great accuser, the source of all trials and challenges which confront man. This wild spirit wastes away man's flesh. It is the root of all slander and falsehood and evil which people speak about each other. And it is called the end of all flesh, according to Genesis 6.13. Uh, because it works for destruction of man's flesh and life, this comes from abusing the faculty of speech. If speech can be so powerful that it can destroy, can you imagine how powerful it is to build and to mend and to fix? It says, it is a great thing if you preserve the learning of the Torah in spite of the, of, of the poverty of your trials and pressures and difficulties. This is the way to achieve perfection in your speech. A thread of loving kindness will draw down over you, and the forces of stern justice and impure raging against you will be thrust aside. Your speech will become cleansed and elevated. The words will flow out in a song of praise to God. Rabbi Nachman of Brislav says that a person who begins to sanctify their their speech and be able that it will draw down a whole new fresh relationship with the creator of the universe just by the power of your speech how you speak to other people has everything to do with with how how god then relates to us empty words devoid of holiness give strength to the temples of idolatry this is a really con uh, interesting idea the hand of falsehood is strengthened and exile is deepened all contact with spirituality in the land of Israel becomes lost. Truth is uh, concealed, divisiveness and strife multiply. So the idea is if I use idle, empty words or words of destruction toward another person, I am inducing uh, wisdom flees from me. My Torah flees from me. I, I will then lack the ability to be able to discern what is true and not true. Think about this for a moment. If I'm constantly denigrating another human being, it says that all of a sudden you build an illusion of your world. A completely different illusion. Have you ever talked to someone who they're ranting and raving about another person or issue, and you're going, that's, that's not even true. I mean, they're seeing this wrong. I mean, that is not the truth. What happens is a person who doesn't have control of their speech, all of a sudden will develop an illusional world that is, that is absolutely false. It's not true at all. It says, talking in a derogatory way about other person, of other people, reinforces the power of fantasy and illusion within us. When people use bad language and speak derogatory about others, their da'at or their knowledge and understanding is taken away from them and they fall from the love of God into an animalistic passion and desire. If you want to feed the yetzer, the animal nature, 
begin to act like an animal and be vicious toward other people. It'll just, it'll, it will will feed that. It says, the source of these passions and desire is in the faculty of fantasy and imagination, which is part of man's animal nature. It feeds upon falsehood and slander. It directly opposes to the faculty of memory through, through which we keep true facts of our situation and our eternal destiny. So this idea that my negative speech and evil speech uh, towards someone else feeds my animalistic nature. When the animalistic nature gets fed, then its world turns into um, a very self-centered animalistic world. I, you know, we've seen dogs, if you have dogs at your house, uh, they get jealous of each other. Have you ever seen that? You pet one and the other one comes in and wants its head up under it. It's, it's an animal. It doesn't know anything else, but I want to feel special too, right? And you have, to, you have to try to give them all that special kind of attention. Do cats do that? I think cats do. I don't know. Not so much. Cats are kind of snooty. Yeah, they don't care whether you like them or not. They're just there, right? Uh, but it's the animalistic nature. If someone were to come to me and say, but you don't understand, people are so mean to me, and they're horrible to me, and they say all kinds of horrible things to me, and I'm constantly, if you're, and, and I'm constantly just having problems, problems with my friends, with my parents, with my neighbor, then who is the problem? You understand? If everybody is giving that one person a rash, then I have to ask, what is that person speaking? How are they talking? What's the power of their speech? Is it possible that that person never says anything negative to those other people, but speaks it at home? Somehow, something is awry. Because the average person does not go around in life having that much conflict with everybody. At some point, you have to look at yourself. It says, you must speak words, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, this is really good. Rabbi Nachman says that in this process, you have to serve Hashem or struggle to, to combat this with every drop of blood in your body. I mean, it's so important to elevate your speech to a holy level, sanctified level, that you have got to do it. It is so imperative that there is no way to get around it, that if you want to succeed in your spiritual walk, you must do this, struggle to control and to possess, what do you call it, take control of your speech. Every word that comes out of your mouth should be done with like every drop of blood, like just with sweat and travail, you've got to control it. And that's hard. Some people have harder time than others, I think. Then it says you will find peace and the spirit of strife and contention will be broken. If a person has spirit, a, a, a life of contention and strife, then bottom line, their, their speech is creating that vessel. Remember, we can have a vessel for good or a vessel for bad, right? So if a person has constant strife and they're home, then they need to check how they are talking, talking and communicating with others, friends, etc. It says, for contention and rivalry have their source in the drops of blood with which a person has not yet served God. I'm going to say it again. For contention and rivalry have their source in the drops of blood with which a person has not yet served God. Now what does it mean to serve him with every drop of blood? Meaning that you become completely consumed in your passion to God to serve God. And we can talk about serving Him by go feeding the poor or giving tzedakah. But if you really want to serve God, just keep your mouth shut and speak positive things when it does open. Right? Speak, speak hope and life. That's serving Hashem. Serving it with the utmost of passion. So instead of walking in and puking all over everyone, walk in and elevate somebody. It's powerful. It says, the words of Torah and prayer have the power to rise up the fallen sparks and restore and renew the fallen worlds. 
The one who speaks them is accounted as if he has created heaven and earth and all worlds of afresh. We must speak only words of holiness and nothing else. Then the sparks will be raised up, the worlds will be restored, and Mashiach will come. So the next time that you're interacting with someone in the community, now you don't have to say, Maimonides says, Rashi says, usually what I'll do, do, do I? Yeah, Rod says, the Rod Bod, the Rod Bomb. Uh, you don't have to do all that, but you can simply say, you know, a wise person once said, quote a tzaddik, elevate a person's life. I don't know a person in this room or that watches video that would say, I'm satisfied with being in poverty and strife. But if you're tired of poverty and strife in your life, then change your vessel. First, you speak words of hope in life. You have sanctified speech, which is holy, which is kind, compassionate. Be like Hashem. Speak words that is full of loving kindness. Quote the Zadiks. Quote Torah. Elevate it. You don't have to be all hyper-religious to do all this. Just quote the Torah as it is. And then when you do that, you create not only a vessel that is open for the blessings of God, but you have a conduit in which God can bring blessing. If you want to know the secret of success in life, of, of prosperity and goodness, it's through speaking prosperity and goodness. That's what it is. It's not talking about, you know, a person that uh, Rabbi Nachman of Brizzle says, a person that's consumed with money, money and greed uh, blocks up blessing from God. So we're not talking about speaking words of blessing for the sake of wealth. You understand? You want to speak words of blessing for the sake of what? Heaven. You want to speak words of goodness and holiness for the sake of speaking goodness and holiness. But Rabbi Nachman tells us very clearly, this sort of raises up new worlds. It's as if when you speak words of Torah and pray in itself, this is like creating a new heaven, a new earth in your life. It says you must speak Torah and prayer to the point where your body becomes to totally nullified, as if literally did not exist. To achieve this, you must develop true awe of heaven. This will bring you peace and harmony, and the world will be filled with blessing. What does it mean to nullify yourself? Think about it for a second. Does it mean like, I'm nobody, I'm no good. I'm a horrible person. That's not what it means. That's exactly it. No. Uh, I heard this said that the next time that you get your feelings hurt by something that somebody says or does, you need to tell yourself, well, if you didn't have so much pride, you wouldn't get your feelings hurt. Right? It's like if, it, if it's not out there, then it wouldn't have gotten hurt. If you've nullified yourself, you go, yeah, who am I anyway? There's a big difference, right? So the next time you feel like, <laughs> he said mean stuff to me, or she said mean stuff to me, like, okay, get your pride out of the way. Realize you need to nullify yourself. And I'm going to tell you what, sometimes we hear things we don't want to hear. But what, one of the things that we learn from uh, the Brislov tradition, you might receive criticism that is actually not even criticism that should belong to you. But the reason why you're receiving it is because you are not judging yourself properly. You understand? You're, you're not working some details out. Are you following what I'm saying? Somebody might come up to you at work and criticize you for something you've done that you're completely you know, in, in, in the right about. Don't walk off and say this guy is, you know, that you're a victim. You need to walk away from that going, Hashem, is there something that I need to examine in my life that is true? that is real, that I need to examine and correct. That is true wisdom. It says, when a person sits down and starts discussing somebody else, it is a day of judgment, for he is in effect sitting in judgment of, uh, on his neighbor. It says, you must, uh, very carefully, you must be very careful about this. Take a good look at yourself and ask you uh, if you are worthy to pass judgment on your friend. Judgment belongs to God. As our rabbi said, uh, don't 
do not judge your neighbor until you come into his place, which is found in, in Volt uh, uh, 2 5. It says, Who really knows the place of his neighbor and who can come there uh, aside from God alone? We've heard from uh, many other religious traditions that you shouldn't judge. But Torah teaches us to judge favorably and to judge with, uh, with justice, correct? So there's nothing wrong with judging, but at the same time, this, we have to remember God pays measure for measure. So if I bring judgment on another person or uh, other people on a constant basis, that is the same level that I'll be judged. That's scary, okay? So that means that whenever you judge somebody, that's why we judge favorably, because we want Hashem when it comes time for our judgment, to judge favorably for us. The Talmud says that a man who nullifies himself and is humble, that when Hasatan comes before his judgment, uh, comes, uh, brings you before the judgment, that he will want to say all the negative things that you've done. Because of your humility and your lowliness, that Hashem won't even hear him. He just won't hear him. He just won't hear him. But if you're haughty and arrogant, then you've brought judgment on yourself. And you will be judged with the same haughtiness and arrogance that you've judged other people. It's a pretty powerful thing. The last, uh, the last part is trust is the foundation of perfect speech. When we acknowledge God, praise Him, and learn His laws, all Lines of truth spread their radiance throughout different aspects of speech and bring it to perfection. Speech has tremendous power. Speak many words of Torah, say many prayers, and make all kinds of appeals and entreaties to God. More than anything else, talk to God in your own words. Hit by the do. Personal prayer. If you are determined to make practice of this every day in your life, you will certainly attain the ultimate good, both in this world and the world to come. That concludes this year, this lecture. Any questions, comments?